everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Charlie from GRC World Forums and the topic for today's webinar is when good data do goes bad, how to shine a light on sensitive, toxic and risky data. Great. Thanks, Charlie. And uh, thanks for everyone who has joined us today. Hopefully we'll have a uh, rollicking good time talking about uh, when uh, good data goes bad. Uh, I'm Dean Gondowski, I'm our CMO, CMO at uh, ActiveNav and help run all of our uh, channel and partner related activities. Um, just a quick um, a few seconds about ActiveNav. We're an enterprise software company. Um, we operate around the world, as you can see here, in, in six continents, um, particularly in America, EMEA and APAC. Uh, and we do uh, largely data privacy and information governance software solutions and um, have been in business for just over a dozen years, um, working on a range of uh, large enterprise, um, federal and other type of engagements. Brian, you wanna go next? Absolutely, Dean, thank you very much and really pleased to be here with everyone today. Um, so a little bit about myself. My name is Brian Segobiano. I'm a managing director with uh, Epsilon Life Sciences and Epsilon Economics. We're a uh, consulting and expert advisory firm. Uh, from my background, I'm a certified information privacy professional and serve as a third party DPO. I've helped a couple hundred organizations now at this point since pre GDPR build and develop privacy programs um, all the way from the strategic level down to implementing more technical tools to help better govern uh, information and the risk that it can present organizations. More, more broadly, Epsilon also has robust practices that help build compliance programs. We serve as independent government appointed monitors and expert witnesses in some of the largest IP uh, international trade uh, litigations throughout the world. And really excited about our, uh, our talk here today, Dean. All right, and uh, for folks who uh, are on the webinar today, feel free to ask questions via the, uh, the question uh, application here, and we'll try to address those the best we can. Uh, from an agenda standpoint, um, we're gonna start off, you know, at the high level with um, some challenges around definitions. And um, I think that will set the stage. Different people think about uh, different terms in different ways and what those mean operationally. Uh, and then the meat of our discussion is gonna be around um, data mapping and creating an inventory for your data, certainly as it relates to you know, data privacy regulations. Uh, and we obviously wanna make this practical. So we will talk about um, where to start and, um, and for organizations struggling to begin, or, or maybe in some instances where they've begun and had difficult first steps, um, there might need to be a reboot. So we'll cover all that as we go. Uh, it, this is a, a great meme in terms of the confusion around, and we'll hit some of it as we talk today, uh, the difference between um, data mapping, um, inventory solutions, um, understanding your data and, and what that really means. And this butts up pretty quickly against data privacy regulations and what you must do for those regulations, as well as some other concepts that we'll talk around about around you know, big data and data lakes and the like. And so there's, there's this inherent tension that will be um, threaded through today's discussion about the desire to retain information for useful business purposes and the reality that oftentimes organizations don't do that and um, they are facing the, the, the negative side of the coin, which is uh, liability and exposure for privacy regulated uh, missteps in terms of how they keep and retain and protect information. And there is a little bit of lag as we go between slides, so, so apologies there. Um, this is, you know, kind of a stock and trade. There's a lot of data. Um, we all know that. I think uh, for my takeaway, the the it's not just the volume, it's the variety and velocity for those folks familiar with the, the three V's of big data. And I think in particular, the variety is what's really hamstringing organizations. Um, we hear, Brian, I'd be interested in your take. Um, people are very quickly um, starting to struggle with new, or relatively new data forms, certainly um, post pandemic. And so Slack and Teams and some of the cloud and, and social platforms are gaining a lot of steam. Um, those platforms, in, in my experience, are some of the least governed out there. And so that that um, variety of data sources is really uh, challenging organizations as we move forward. Yeah, Dean, I agree. I mean, you look at where most organizations were at, you know, 10, 5, maybe even three years ago, and we're moving 
you know, if we're not already there, you know, completely moving more towards, you know, cloud SaaS based solutions, we're not building, maintaining things in house on prem. So not only are we, you know, less certain of what information we have because we're relying on third parties. Also, that is turning over much more quickly. So when we used to potentially keep the same system for a specific purpose for 10 years and had all this institutional knowledge about it, you know, we might switch our HR system every two years. Um, and, you know, if there's a new vendor, new data, you know, old old data, it, you know, we take our eye off the ball a little bit. It almost feels like when you, I see a slide like this, I always say I'm a, I'm a football coach as well. I feel like every year, uh, you know, if I'm on on uh, defense, I'm having one individual taken away and the offense gets one more more person. Um, you know, it's hard. To, it's hard to keep up with it when the growth is this. Yeah, size. it is. And I think we, we, we won't probably talk about it too much, but the whole shadow IT with remote um, workforces um, is, is certainly at play here. And um, the ability for people in, in their attempts to be productive um, to spin up um, a variety of different systems that may not be um, authorized for the organization. And, and then needless to say, that then means the surface area for uh, the data breach environment, you know, just increases. So this is a, this is a game of whack-a-mole for, for IT governance and InfoSec folks, certainly. Uh, from a big data perspective, I mentioned this at, at, at the top, there, there is this fundamental, I think, notion that there's a ton of data out there um, and that that data can be harnessed. Um, and this sort of goes to our title, you know, bigger isn't always better. Um, and so we see that a lot of organizations have a, a huge percentage and sometimes three quarters or more of their data is dark. And by dark, and we'll talk about dark data as we go, um, dark data tends to be this unstructured user created data that is out there in the wild. Uh, maybe it's anything from kind of old school file shares uh, to cloud repositories to some of these social platforms we're talking about. The organization just doesn't know what's in there. And that um, that makes it very hard if you look at that sort of right bullet. You know, every organization wants the, its uh, knowledge workers to be efficient and extract value from their data. It's really hard to do when you don't know what you have. And so we see sort of this you know, shining light on um, your dark data as being one of the more critical things that we'll talk about today. Yeah, Dean, it's a it's a great point. It's it's creating much more risk. We you know look a couple of years ago and the thing was build the build the data like we're going to start to do you know analytics and advanced you know, AI. But really what that's led to is just more risk. We have information sitting out there that you know maybe we think we can't get rid of it because we're going to need it for litigation. It usually hurts more than it. It helps in, in that case. And then as we're collecting more, like on the reporting, the analytics side, it's actually causing quality issues. What's the what's the right system of, of record when we have multiple derivatives of the same information? Yeah, and Brian, I think that's a that's a that's a great point on data lakes. There is certainly a need for highly curated data and data lakes for, for analytical purposes. And, and you're seeing the ton of solutions that come up to make sure that data is really cleansed and curated but you really can't just throw a bunch of data into a pile and then say, let's make some, let's generate some business value out of it. And I think that um, that was what people thought five and 10 years ago, let's just keep it all and we'll sort it out later. And that's really not what's working in practice. And if we go to the next slide, I think this notion of we got it, great. We're sitting on this mountain of data. The reality is it that sort of generalized notion of we'll leverage it one day, doesn't coexist very well with all the data regulations that are out there. Um, and Brian, you mentioned in a GDPR and some of the other things at the outset, and we'll talk about those more specifically, but there are a ton of organization, um, organizational sort of frameworks that talk about um, data minimization, um, continuous monitoring, um, keeping data for legitimate business purposes. And so you have this now tension of, is data more likely to be um, valuable in this sort of amorphous lake that we've got, uh, this uncurated, or is it more likely to be risky? And we're we're seeing with the increased regulatory environment that you're more likely to be sitting on a bunch of dark, toxic data than you are unharnessed, you know, helpful data. Let's go to next, Marissa, and then um, and Brian, you're you're the expert here, and um, I'm sure we're not going to spend uh, hours on this slide as we could. Um, but what, what do you think about some of the, the highlights on, on the privacy regulations that you'd articulate? 
Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it from a principal's perspective for years, the need to better manage our data and have better governance. But we're seeing it now, it's it's becoming a compliance obligation rather than just a, a best practice. We have to be doing this. And that's codified in these laws. I mean, GD, GDPR, obviously well-known one, the concept of data minimization, you re referred to it. That has been copied over almost word for word, I believe, in the Virginia and the, the Colorado law here in the U.S., which will go into effect here in, in 2023. Um, mentioned earlier at the top of the call that, you know, call it a data map, you call it a records of processing, a data inventory. You know, obviously, Article 30 of the GDPR, many individuals are familiar with that. We have to document what activities are causing us to collect and use personal information and why are we doing it? How long do we keep it? The most substantial shift, you know, recently in, in my mind has been CPRA that they've added on, the, you know, CCPA 2.0 is some may hear it called this concept that organizations have to start disclosing in that online privacy notice. So, you know, externally facing, accessible to regulators, length of time that the business intends to keep uh, each category of personal information, uh, including sensitive personal information, which is a new concept in the CC in the CPRA. So that to me is a huge shift and where I see a lot of organizations struggle. We even if we just kind of get by with some flexible language that says, oh, as long as we need it for legal or business purposes, the fact that we have to start externally putting that out there means that regulators are going to come and ask for it. Okay, like you say, as long as necessary for business purpose or legal reasons, show us. And we're seeing that in the C, uh, C, in some of the warning letters that are coming out from uh, the Attorney General's office. Yeah, and Brian, I, I, I didn't ask you this uh, in, in prep, so it's, I don't, hopefully it's not too much of a curveball, but it feels to me like the what you're just talking about with CPRA falls into this kind of the first time ever where you're getting real governance type of notions about data retention and periods by type into one of the privacy regulations. And I'm not familiar with any other that has that. Is that my interpretation or, or do you share that as well? It's it's the most clearly codified that we've seen. Abs absolutely. So, you know, we had, again, these principles of, of minimization and and, you know, having this, you know, only retain data for so long, but actually having, again, extremely put out there. Yes, absolutely. It's the first time that we've really seen it codified in this way. And it's it's a challenge, right? Because this says we have to report it by category of personal information. We think of our retention schedules internally, which, you know, most organizations probably, if, if pressed on it, might say those aren't, aren't being completely applied or complied with throughout the organization. But we think about that more as the category of, of use. So there's kind of this interwoven um, concept here that's oh, oh, that's a, a challenge to square up when we think about how long we're retaining information because it somewhat depends on on the use of it not just the category of information yep and um, we've got a question and I just want to make sure we get to it I think in in flow a little bit um, somebody says as discussion on uh, this discussion on data is new to me what exactly does the term dark data mean uh, I, I think that's a little bit in the the eye of the beholder uh, the way we talk about it, it tends to be your ability to understand what you have and whether that's via a data map, um, and sometimes data maps have flows, whether there's an actual inventory that gets down to the individual item level, um, the ability to under understand your data estate. And as you understand your data estate, we'll talk about this throughout the flow, you will then see things that are um, redundant, obsolete, and trivial. You'll see things that are sensitive. You'll see things that are um, have, have are transitory um, in the business. And so fundamentally, our, our belief, and I'm sure Brian shares this, is it's very hard to manage what you don't have visibility into. Um, and I'm sure as a consultant, you go in to try to figure things out for clients. Um, and I would, I would guess one of the first things is, you know, tell me what you have, where is it? And all these sort of qualifying questions about your, your information infrastructure. Right? Is that probably fair, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. We always think of, you know, two large categories of dark data that we come across is one information that we just didn't expect that we would be collecting some, you know, not to I'll kind of pick on the, the marketing folks, if you don't mind for a minute, Dean. But, um, you know, we uh, we have this CRM system and we started putting all this, you know, personal information of, of, of customers, you know, in there, even though that may be against our policies. The other is we know that maybe this is information that we expect to have, but we didn't think that it was being stored in this information. Someone just dumped the HR system data into, into the data lake, right? And then retained it forever. And now we have an employment investigation and we have to produce a lot more data uh, than we ever thought because we you know, expected we were deleting this. So those are kind of the two flavors that we see of, of dark data. Yeah, and we'll, as we go to the next slide, maybe the, the question will really be, 
And I think this is really in, kind of an interesting highlight. We at ActiveMap, we did a, a ton of work with um, Equifax post their, their data, you know, now infamous data breach. And um, there's this um, kind of perverse irony where the company, and it could be anyone because most companies don't understand their data very well, the company doesn't understand its data super well and it's dark to them. The people who end up shining a light on the dark data are the hackers. And you'll see, I won't, I won't go through all the sort of detail here in the minutia of you know, all the, all the facts. Um, but the reality is that you see the, the 287 days to, to um, understand and, and remediate a breach. Those are, you know, close to a year of time that hackers are in the environment, shining a light on data and trying to see what they can find. Um, and so many ways the, the hackers then understand, the threat actors understand your your data better than you do, and they're um, exfiltrating it, taking out, and and further perpetrating the breach. And so I think, if nothing else, you've got this one-two punch of you've got the privacy regulations and the the the, the reality of breach. And um, I love this term, the sort of assume breach. We're now at the, not not at the point where people can think it might just be their neighbors. You you either have been breached, and if you're like I think it's T-Mobile, they've been breached five times over the last several years. Um, it's just going to be the new normal. And so that does, I think, shed light on um, how you think about uh, governing and, um, and understanding your data. Um, and this is a little bit to the dark data slide. Um, we talked about, you know, the question a second ago, and I think I saw another one on dark data. So let me see if I can uh, multitask here and get to it. But is um, dark data undiscovered and uncategorized? I think. Um, Yes, certainly. And it also depends on somebody somewhere may understand the data, but does the organization and the legal and regulatory and governments and privacy professionals, do they understand the data, right? It, it has to be at the level of um, are the people, when there's a piece of sensitive data that exists in, in, in a folder somewhere, is that able to come to the surface? So the company or their, their, um, their third party advisors like Brian can come in and say, all right, we've got this repository somewhere that's just chock full of sensitive data and it shouldn't be there. And so um, I would say, yeah, undiscovered and uncategorized. And, and so for us, categorize and classification are kind of the key things we do. We will we'll apply rule sets to say, this is a, a piece of information that is sensitive because it has a national identifier or it because, because it has a birthday or because of X. And then the organization can make decisions about it. And so I think that's a, a really good question because it does show the, um, the distinction between you know, dark generally and once you have visibility and then you need to start making sense of that. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little further as we, we get into the discussion. But let's go to next and, um, and, and talk about data mapping. Because to me, Brian, love, love your thoughts on this. It feels like for the last 20 years, we've said, yeah, let's do data mapping. We do data mapping for e-discovery, for mergers, acquisitions, for data privacy. And that exercise has always been, well, let's go talk to some people. Let's go do some custodian interviews. And um, for folks who don't recognize, those are um, floppy disks, um, in case you're wondering what those are. Those are not um, drink coasters, although that did work. If you had enough AOL floppy disks, you can make some like interesting uh, art out of those. I'm dating myself, certainly. Um, but we relied upon this sort of like, let's go talk to Fred and Sally and ask them where they store their data. And that's dangerous because Fred and Sally may not know where they store their data. And then two, that exercise, the second you do it becomes kind of obsolete because um, a month from now, you got to go do it all over again because things change, data change. We talked about um, the velocity of, of data moving forward. Uh, Brian, what, what are your thoughts on, um, on, on data mapping and maybe a little bit of the his history of data mapping and where you see some of the pitfalls? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, history. I'm I'm seeing the disc now on there, and I'm you know uh, the the next uh, conference we're at. I think that's going to be the swag is handing those out as coaches. Uh, I probably played Oregon Trail on one of those uh, in the past, but no. To your your point, and yes, it's you know we historically you know this is, was originally driven a lot. You know, e-discovery preparedness, mergers and acquisitions. We need to go around and conduct some interviews, understand what do we what do we what do we believe we had, what do we think we should have you know, the systems, the processes, the third parties. GDPR really started to really, again, codify that as a requirement that organizations had to do. 
But you know, at that point, what was happening is a lot of organizations were effectively just doing form compliance. One time we talked to, we think this is what it is, set it, forget it. We've talked about, you know, and you made a good point about, you know, shadow IT, things change and, and, and they should, right? Like I'm a business owner too. Organizations need to be agile. We need to be innovative and find new solutions and, and go faster. And along with that is going to come new third parties, new systems, um, you know, kind of new innov innovative ways to combine data internally and externally. So trust, but verify, right? There needs to be some actual operationalization beyond just form compliance, because as you said, we might think that we don't have a social security number sitting in the system, you know, right now, we don't have names, but um, in the future, we we want to, we want to start doing cross contextual advertising um, and identify when our customers are, are visiting our websites, right? Like that's a big uh, push now with digit, um, uh, digit, digitization with uh, a lot of organizations, especially as folks are, are working, you know, from and, and living more at home and other places. So it, you have to have that bottoms up approach to really operationalize this for the long term and not get yourself stuck in this cycle of just trusting what someone, you know, says and, and taking that as, as the gospel of your data. Yeah. And I, I like that uh, notion there. Cause I think that's the other thing we've seen is can you, can you trust what you think, you know, and if you're a data privacy per person, uh, professional, how, how well do you sleep at night? Right. Do you, and in particular, we see a ton, um, Brian, I'm sure you see some of this, which is um, uh, some of the software that's out there. We'll, we'll focus on the flows of data, right? There's a, a department, there's a system and the data flows between the departments and systems. And it's a super high level conceptual model. Well, largely. And those are, are fine. The real question I think we're highlighting is, does the data actually flow that way? And can you can you really trust it so that um, you're prepared in whatever time frame a merger acquisition happens or a breach happens, and then it's revealed that the data doesn't actually flow the way you thought it flowed. And to me, that's that blind spot that is in particular um, really challenging for organizations. So let's move next into you know how we um, how you start, and I think we had a, a, a good question that even teased this up. Um, and the question was, um, as my agency's records officer, I'm struggling with attorneys and engineers' mindset of potential business use. How do we rein in the just in case thought process? Well, first of all, that that's a that is a great question, and. Um, as an attorney, uh, feel free to blame me and other people for having sort of this, um, you know, oftentimes theoretical view of the world. We conceptually might want to use all this data. Um, I think the reality is what you have to do, and there's a, there's a Gartner analyst, this guy, Nader Heinen, he talks about the realized value of data. So conceptual value of data is sort of infinite, right? If you draw the formula out, the practical liability of data is much more pragmatic. And I, I would move philosophically and have a discussion with you know, executives and stakeholders that the potential value of data um, is not helpful for anyone. And, and we're in the middle of a variety of sports seasons right now. They, they talk about coach killers, right? And, and an athlete's potential is what kills a coach. The, the reality of the performance is what's important. And so if your, if your organization really is using data, great. Um, but if it's not, that's where you need to start philosophically. Um, and this, the, even this first bullet point of, you know, the, we don't have the chart in here, but there's a, a, a interesting chart that basically shows the, the half-life of data and its utility falls off within days, weeks, months, I and mean, certainly at, at months. And so data that you have that, is five years old, unless it's a very specific business record, is is extremely unlikely to be valuable. Um, and there's a bunch of reports that you can do uh, around this, which is look at data and its age and its last access date. And one of the things we find, um, Brian, I'm sure you've seen this out there, is um, it's not hard to overlay really old data with people who owned the data who are no longer with the company. So it's old, whoever created it is gone. There's a very slim chance that that um, that that data is going to be useful you know, going forward. Yeah, I yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a metrics driven person. I think that's the perfect one, right, Dean? Like we say, we think we're we're going to need it. Okay, we haven't touched it in X years, and it's five years past the retention schedule. It's kind of like that, you know, that that shirt I can't get myself to throw away. 
uh, in my closet that my wife very much would like me to, th to throw away. You know, you, you, you think it is, but the reality of it is, is, is it's not. And then the numbers say that the other, the other things that we see as well, um, you know, one, it creates more risk and we, you can see that anecdotally that from a litigation perspective, it's just going to increase your cost when you have to go through document productions. I've been involved in it again, using the HRS system as, as an example where information was just, you know, retained back to the you know beginning of the organization's uh, founding that just it, it created a, a disaster when they needed to produce everything um, rather than just the you know five to six years they may have had to under if they're filing the retention schedule on the other side of it too where we see a lot of pushes is just from a data quality perspective the ability to make data informed decisions if your product development team has their own derivative of of, of a data set and then the sales and marketing team takes their their own copy of it starts and you know doing their own enrichment of it and the data starts to conflict how are you going to make a correct decision um, about where to move your business if you have all these derivative data sets yeah that's and, and there's a ton in there here and we're not going to be able to cover all this i i think the i like the bullet of just start i mean the you know don't let the great be the enemy of the good right it's um we've seen this with, with information governance and other initiatives over the past decade if you wait for the the all singing and dancing um, program, it's unlikely to start. And so we see most people that are that are successful, pick a pain point, a business function. Um, and we've got tons of these with with regulatory uh, regimes starting to happen. It's very clear with all the, the implementation dates of uh, CPRA, something's going to happen. You got to start a start an initiative on how are we going to respond to this? And then, you know, maybe not don't go company wide, but go um, business unit um, or function or something and, and go that route. And I think once you start, you get, it's very classic, you get some wins, uh, you see how the tools work and then um, you can go from there. Yeah, so I think narrow, narrow and deep is a great way to start just you know, quick on this. And if, for those develop, if anyone's got a development background, it's like it's the agile versus the waterfall approach. We always find that you know some organizations wanna sit back, what are, what's every attribute that I wanna collect about the information, every risk analysis I wanna do on it, if you just start having conversations with with a few folks, you're going to very quickly realize what are those Wild West data systems that we really need to focus our efforts on, you know, within usually oftentimes just days, not not weeks or months. If you try to do the, you know, the, you know yeah, to that point, uh, Brian, we we see what people kind of get bogged down is in, in looking at their um, all the systems that are out there. So they go like, OK, we have 74 different systems and we understand want to understand them all. Sure, conceptually, you have to start somewhere. Uh, and the question is, and for a lot of our clients, it's start with the messiest and easiest ones and the most uh, voluminous ones to get your arms around, which is, um, you know, file shares and other sort of file share like repositories. There's huge amounts of data, it's legacy. Start there and then move into uh, more modern forms of data. Those data, you know, if, if you're using um, Slack and, and Teams and the like, you probably haven't been using those for 20 years. Um, you probably have been using your file share systems and SharePoint and some other things for, for decades. Um, so again, start somewhere and then continue to, um, to mature your process. Um, this is, uh, we've talked a little bit about, this kind of gets into the weeds, um, but in a helpful way, I think, which is um, a lot of stuff I'm sure, Brian, you, you consult with folks on is, uh, business objectives, regulatory requirements, records management needs. Um, you know, maybe talk to, I'm sure you guys have a playbook that you go in with um, to help organizations figure out all, all these questions out if they if they don't have it sorted out already. Yeah, there's a lot of stakeholders in this. And I mean, actually that that helps sometimes if you're the, the privacy officer and you feel like data mapping is up to you, solicit some, some budget from other areas. We've talked about it, legal and e-discovery want to, um, want to know what information we have so that they can respond quickly and efficiently and, and, and completely to uh, document and, and data request. Your information security team certainly wants to know what information you're holding where and where we need to implement additional technical organizational um, security measures from the privacy side. You know, having this type of information helps you not just comply with the the, the data protection laws, but also write accurate privacy notices, right? We have to disclose what type of information we collect and for what purpose and having a, a data map, especially when we get to those systems that are very unstructured and 
and and on unregulated and having something like this in place allows you to defensive you defend what you're externally stating to individuals about what you collect and how long you keep it. Yeah, Brian, you mentioned the different stakeholders. Um, where, thank you. Um, you mentioned the different stakeholders. Who, who do you see being as the most critical people in the room? And then maybe some of the might have nice to have people that are in, in this discussion. And I think maybe that's, again, in a helpful starting place of of how do you build kind of this right level of coalition? Because there's, there's certainly not just a singular person that is going to um, determine a lot of these um, business, legal, and regulatory objectives. Yeah, I mean, the the quarterbacks, if you will, the process is going to stick with our, uh, our our sports analogy, right? Tend to be those folks from um, the the risk and compliance or the, or the legal function, depending on how what size your organization is. So, but that's not necessarily the most critical in surfacing the information. They kind of provide, you know, the governance and tend to be the, the project managers, if you will, um, of it. But you know, really, there there's many critical folks when we get down to it. It's the obviously there's the uh, the information technology team who's going to have the list of which systems we know are approved and regulated, but really you need to start engaging kind of some preliminary questions with the actual, with the business uh, itself, your different functions, um, not just, you know, this is not just a legal IT security exercise. We have to understand product development, sales and marketing, customer onboarding, you know, who, website teams that are managing, you know, websites and, and applications uh, where they are, storing their working files, their their systems of record. And if that doesn't square up with what the IT th team thinks um, we should have, we need to start addressing, scanning, analyzing, and governing those uh, those systems better. So there's there's a lot of folks um, that are that are really critical to to the process. Yeah. And then Brian, how for, for your perspective, how do you do you guys facilitate that discussion and get all the right people in the room? And it, it strikes me that's got to be one of the bigger challenges of you know, anything organized, organized and designed by committee is going to be a bit fraught with different objectives and personalities and risk profiles, et cetera. Is that something you guys do or do you rely upon the client to sort of figure that out ahead of time? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, it's a phased approach and we've got a lot of experience doing it. So kind of know, you know, we know a bit where the bodies are, are probably going to be. I mean, the, the starting point is just with your core stakeholder group. We talked about probably legal, you know, IT, you know, security, if those are hopefully separate functions within your organization compliance, you know, what, what are the, what's our, what's our objective? Like you said, are we trying to comply with, with CPRA or is our goal to start getting rid of information um, that we, we don't need anymore? So establishing those, then we go to kind of, we get to what we call the functional level. So who are those kind of key individuals, you know, across, marketing, sales, you know, HR, all those different functions that don't need to know all the details of what's in there, um, but can at least point us in the right direction. Yes, these are the core systems, you know, that that we use. And then at that point, the next phase is starting to engage more of the frontline business users that are collecting, analyzing information, putting it into uh, the, the data stores. And now with all that, to the point earlier, like we're not waiting to get through all that to start actually analyzing the information. Let's start up some pilots. You're going to get through a couple of those functional interviews, as we would call them, and, and already know this is a system that is, is creating risk for us. There's no need to wait until you get done speaking with the entire organization to start uh, addressing that. You're going to get some really quick wins um, early on. Yep, that's good. All right. Well, let's keep moving. Um, I think the key to to this whole discussion is, as we've talked about, the visibility into your data as a as a starting place. Um, and and to your point, Brian, while you're having stakeholder interviews, the ability to say, okay, that's that's what you believe to be happening with your data universe. Um, let's shed some light on it and actually look at what what data flows, data movement, data inventories are actually out there happening um and to me that's the um that's the light bulb moment for a lot of clients which is um they have they have a little bit of a delusional sense about what their data estate looks like and so um we'll talk here in the next slide about um what what we're doing out there and this is something relatively new for active nav we've launched this new product called inventory and um it's really about shining light on this data and keeping it uh, evergreen and 
and um, continuous in terms of your, your visibility. Because once you build, once you do the interviews, um, presumably you'll still do some of those. And once you connect a solution like this to your data sources, you don't want to unplug it the next day, right? We, we talk about this kind of being the, the Fitbit um, of your sort of data health, which is you want to just start kind of using it and seeing um, what is out there and then being able to understand how your landscape changes. And particularly if you've got, uh, Brian here, you've talked about kind of a, a triage or kind of remediation efforts, you know, where you're out there um, attacking a data source or a repository, um, you you do really want to then see that it's working, right? So if it's, we've got, we use pre pretty simple um, color schemes here, which is, you know, red is bad and toxic data and, and green is good. There's ability and shades in between. There's ability to go in, understand a data source that might be problematic. You can look at, you know, business units, geography, et cetera, and then take some remediation action. Find this data that, that's there that shouldn't be there. Maybe it's transitory. Maybe the data is ultimately the right kind of data, but it got left out in the wild. We see this a ton. And then the ability to, um, to look at that and, and move forward. And we think you know, fundamentally that this has to happen relatively quickly. If this is taking you six months to get a view of your data and then six months to refresh the view, it doesn't really work, you know, going back to the Fitbit, if it's not able to track, you know, your sleep or whatever, or other blood pressure, or whatever it might be, you know, day to day, hour to hour, it, it's got a lot less utility. So, so we think this, the move into sort of continuous, you know, data mapping is really important. Um, and, um, and so that, that's really key for us. Brian, I don't know if you've got any thoughts kind of on, yeah, our sort of a continuous, sort of uh, data discovery kind of mechanism. Yeah, I mean, if we have to, if we want to move something, we have to measure it, right? So, and this type of a, a visualization, I think we're, you know, a lot of us here on, on the phone or, or the webinar here are probably risk and, and compliance professionals, maybe not always getting the budget that we, you know, need and, and deserve. And that's because when we go to stakeholders, executives, the board, and we just present sometimes words on, on slides of activities we've conducted, that doesn't resonate with with most folks when we start to show numbers hey we have this many terabytes gigabytes whatever it is of, of information we've identified this much of it is um is, is redundant obsolete trivial we've reduced the footprint or we've kept it you know lower than our um our, our customer growth or something those types of metrics speak more and demonstrate the value that everyone on here is providing their their organization so we should we should all want to be able to produce some you know some of those metrics that that, that help tell the good story of, of what, we're, what we're doing. But I think it's critical to have something like this that, that starts to really measure what we want to move. Yeah, and we often refer to it as sort of instrumentation, right? You're going to do a lot of, you're going to spend time, money, and energy, let's, let's say building a data subject access request mechanism. Um, how do you have the instrumentation that tells you you're getting the right stuff at the right time frame and and the like. So I, th I think this is really key. We, we see tons of people that want to focus on the end state or the end problem and often neglect kind of the first um, the first step that they need to do in terms of understanding uh, their data universe. Let's go to next. And um, and I think we we're, we're refer to the our inventory solution as data mapping as a service because you don't want to have a data mapping, data mapping be a series of manual exercises and snapshots. You ideally want to have it work, have a have visibility to your data estate, uh, and then continue to uh, maybe add more um, types of data, see changes when you do um, work with somebody like Brian and their team to um, reduce your surface area, take red sort of toxic data out of the organization, um, quarantine it, encrypt it, delete it, whatever it might be. Um, and so we're, we're seeing this, you know, tons of benefits that, that flow into lots of these other programs. Um, one of them is, is to understand the nature and extent of the problem to begin with, right? Because it is difficult sometimes getting buy-in and budget and consensus when you, you assume your data is all pristine and being used by the organization. Um, and when we work with clients, we find that um, a very simple report that, that shows we're done in obsolete, trivial, and toxic data um, makes uh, people sit forward in their chair and they go, oh, okay, well, 
surprisingly, we are just like every other organization um, that uh, doesn't understand its data and has lots of you know skeletons in the closet. And so for us, there's um, there's a ton of benefits here. Um, and I, I think fundamentally, this this has to be the foundation. You know, insight into your data situation has to be the foundation for you know optimized, compliant, and um, legally defensible you know workflows that are are downstream. All right, uh, Brian, let's uh, let's jump into takeaways. I was just talking, so I'm going to stop for a second. <laughs> why don't you why don't you hit a couple of years and then I'll uh, I'll scoop up anything that you've uh, you haven't touched on. Yeah, I mean, the, the first one we need we need to know what we have, where it is, who, who we're sharing it with, which direction it's flowing. And, and there's, you know, some value in talking to individuals about that. But but we have to ver verify that that's that that's the case and things are changing too quickly. So we need to you know understand it doesn't have to be the entire organization, but those, you know, like the Wild West data stores um, and understanding really what's you know, what what's in scope for us? What should we uh, what should we have? What's the what's the outcome that we want from this? Are we trying to reduce the data? Are we going to be trying to comply with with data protection laws? You know, all, all of the above. What's kind of the order of uh, of operations? So, and those things can all happen in in parallel, right? I think some folks it's it's one or or the other. We're doing a top down or we're doing a bottoms up approach, and 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 you can do both. But we don't need to do it in this waterfall approach. You're going to get you know the best thing I can say is that you know once you talk to just a handful of individuals in those key functions that process large amounts of information, you're going to very quickly identify uh, where your systems of likely concern are, and you can start to pilot that. Dean? Let me hit um, one of the ones on the, the bottom bullet. What are your recommendations for, you know, picking a regulation? And I've, I've heard some of this, you know, do you build do you build to the high water mark? You know, let's say CPRA was the high water mark. Do you build to that? Do you build to GDPR if you're international? Um, with all the regulations that are coming out, um, you know, how do you think about how you build, or do you basically build what is just in essence a good, um, well thought out data privacy um, regime that minimizes, understand, blah blah blah, and then it it can be tuned to the different regulations. How do you think about that kind of last bullet? Yeah, I think there's two two things there. One is like your overall data privacy and protection program. The other is actually how your your classification scheme for your data. From an overall privacy program, a legacy, a lot of folks have said, let's take GDPR, it's the most extensive and that's our, that's our framework. And just as, you know, others have come out in the US, CPRA, Colorado, Virginia, that becomes a bit challenging. So there's really good frameworks like we will you know, typically use the NIST privacy framework. Many folks in their IT departments are probably familiar with that from their, their technical standards, but they, there's a really nice privacy framework that we leverage and map all the controls in there across GDPR, CC, CCPA, Colorado, HIPAA, whatever your or subject to. And that starts to help you prioritize what actions from a program level you wanna have. Now, on the other side, when it comes to actually classifying and managing our data, um, it you know it really depends on where most of your exposure is. If you're a um, you know more of a of a U.S. focused and do domiciled company, something like CPRA really has probably the most robust definitions of what categories of personal information there are, and then also the the concept of um, of sensitive personal information. So we'll see you know at at that level, typically you're gonna you're going to have to kind of pick one standard often um, to, to be able to manage it because there's just too many definitions that are a bit of a Venn diagram of, of overlap. So in the spirit of like, let's just get started. If this is the first time you're doing it, don't try to boil the whole ocean and have a category for everything across the world. Let's pick the one that we have the most exposure to from a data classification perspective, like CPRA. Again, if you're, if you're US and start with that. Yeah, that makes sense. And for folks who don't know the Various regulations all have differing nuances around what is sensitive, and and um, I think to your point, there's some commonality about certain types of information will be sensitive across all the regulations, and it, it probably a good place to start there. The other thing um, I like the sort of uh, next from the last bullet um, around figuring out how to understand and um, limit the amount of personal information collected. This falls only into the you know, do you do you drain the swamp, dam the stream, or try to do both? And certainly, organizations are awash with 
lots of toxic sensitive data, but they're also on a go forward basis, probably not being as purposeful about the data they collect in the first instance. And so uh, I think you need to do both as an organization, but it, but in some ways it, it, it might be easier to start thinking about why you collect what you collect. Um, and um, is it really being realized in terms of the value of that information? And so that to me is a good one, a good way to think about, um, you can't just always be historically cleaning up data and collecting uh, random bits of information on the way in because you're just always in perpetual cleanup mode. And that's a, you know, um, t tail wagging the dog. That is, that is no, I was gonna say Sis Sisyphean task if I got that right of being able to just you know, clean up all your toxic data that you've got. So you do at some level need to rationalize um, how you think about um, collecting it in the first instance, and particularly if it, it does have some level of sensitivity um, and, and it binds you to some legal or regulatory obligation and you're not gonna use it, uh, maybe let's not even collect it in the first instance. And so uh, I think we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, so that's us, uh, in case you, you were wondering. And uh, obviously, you can reach out to either of us if you have any questions and we haven't gotten to them. Um, let's see. If you've already created a data map, how do we update it for the CPRA? So I'd say probably, uh, Brian, interesting thoughts here. My, my first sense would be, you know, a data map of flows is really helpful. A data inventory of all the types of data and their sensitivity is extremely helpful. Um, then isn't kind of to your earlier point, overlaying that with CPRA versus GDPR versus Virginia is those are the details you'd work with somebody like yourself on to sort of then go, well, it's sensitive for one regulation, but not for another kind of thing. Yeah, I think we're doing a lot of this right now. And, you know, data maps have been created now and, you know, we're not just doing it for the first time, but we're having to refresh it. And since the last time we did it, there's new regulations that that have come in scope. So specific to the question on, on CPRA. So if you've already created a data map and you have a general sense of the types of information we're collecting, generally where, where it's stored, the purposes for that, the biggest deltas in, in our experience with CPRA is the concept, if you've been mostly US focused, is the concept of sensitive personal information. So if you've already done one for GDPR, there's this kind of you know subset of sensitive personal data you know, over there that exists in the CPRA now as well. So one is identifying where that exists because there's going to be additional requirements around how that information is protected, how you communicate to individuals when you when you are collecting that um, upfront. The other, I think that the, the biggest one is uh, understanding what the retention periods are for it. So we, this, and I, when I by this, I don't just mean, what does our retention schedule, if we have one say, should be the retention period for the information, but what does, uh, how long are, are we actually keeping it? So, and you know, we can rely on folks to say, oh yeah, we follow the retention schedule and it's three years, but if we went and scanned that, um, the, uh, the drive of that information, we're going to see information that's uh, collected there much longer. So I think that is really the, you know, the most critical difference is that we're starting to actually analyze what the true retention period is so that we can not just update the privacy notice to make sure that we're disclosing that appropriately, but really actually start to effectuate something beyond form compliance internally and govern our data. Yeah. And then let's hit the uh, last one and then we'll, we'll wrap up with a few minutes to the hour. Um, how do you eliminate or overcome roadblocks that hinder us from just starting uh, for example, lack of resources, little buy-in from leadership, et cetera. Um, that is obviously a very real um, challenge for organizations. I, won't, I wouldn't, wouldn't minimize it. I'm sure Brian wouldn't either. It does feel like there are um, people out there to help you. So, and, and pilots and things that you can do, you know, active nav will we'll do um, POCs and pilots and lots of things to very quickly, inexpensively and often for free, say, we'll show you a snapshot of your data. Um, I'm sure Brian, you have ways to kind of get people started, um, with some education and some other things. So it feels like if it were me, um, the notion is you don't need a, a six or seven figure initiative with, you know, software and consultants and et cetera. You may eventually get there. Uh, but how do you get started with, let's understand, do we have a problem or not? Um, to me feels like. Uh, the the good first step. And there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, Brian, do you have any thoughts on that as we kind of close out? 
Yeah, I mean, one is just obviously in, engaging in other internal stakeholders that want to do that would benefit by something like a data map or a data inventory. So if you're just an N of one privacy uh, function and not getting the budget, you know, engaging with your information security team, with your with your legal team and, and others, they're going to find benefit from this. So what you have to do then is obviously lay out what's the, the roadmap. And we do work, you know, similar free workshops like this all the time. We kind of lay out, here's what the project plan needs to look like for it, do it internally or, or, or leverage outside, um, help whatever makes sense for your um, organization. But then really, you know, starting to put together, if you're still needing buy-in from um, other stakeholders that control the, the purse, starting to show a visual of what those metrics are going to look like. Ideally, you can go and, and, and do a pilot and say, hey, here's our actual information. But, you know, even just showing some type of a, of a mock of a dashboard, hey, this look, we're going to quantify our our data risk and then we're going to start to, you know, be able to move it. Right now, we, we have no clue and there's no shortage of headlines out there on why that can be a, a challenge. So if you're still running an issue, starting to mock up what those dashboards, those key risk indicators look like, key performance indicators on on, on how you want to improve that are, are a good start to start to help others visualize what the program is going to look like. That's great. I think it's a good way to, to, to wrap things up for today. So thanks everybody for joining and uh, feel free to re reach out to myself or Brian uh, if you've got any questions or comments and uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the questions there, but uh, thanks for joining us today.